All right, I'll start off uh, with the brief sequel to my previous video on making a uh, lightweight frame to hold a dust cover over the Prusa printer. And um, I had shown in that video this photo here of the wood and acrylic frame that just sits on top of the printer's frame. And then the actual cover showed up which was obtained from digitaldeckcovers.com and uh, here are a couple pictures of how that worked out. It, it fit the frame perfectly, the height was perfect, it sat right down to the top of the bench but no higher. It precisely uh, encapsulated the, the dimensions of the printer without being baggy. So I'm quite happy with it. The only problem is it makes a fairly uh, innocuous looking printer look like this huge block of something in the room that when you first walk in it's what your eye goes to. It, that was sort of an unintended consequence but it's not important. Another tidbit is um, considering that the PLA filament I'm using is basically uh, hygroscopic so that it absorbs moisture from the air and I hadn't really thought that much about it except to be generally aware of it and so I was thinking, well, I wanted to hold whatever filament I'm not currently using in some sort of humidity-controlled environment with minimal humidity. And there are expensive ways of doing it that you'd probably want to use if you were doing a lot of 3D printing. But for me, I wanted a cheaper solution, so I was just going to go with vacuum freezer bags or vacuum food storage bags. Uh, and I found this product on Amazon that was uh, geared towards storing the one kilogram standard size filament reels and it had everything you need in one inexpensive packet. This particular one has in the box 20 uh, Ziploc vacuum bags, um, all of the same size, five plastic clips that you use to um, make sure that the zip locks are really seated properly. Uh, there's the one vacuum pump. There are five packages of desiccant. Probably you'd want to use a lot more and I actually have a whole box of desiccant packages that are all sealed until you use them. You're going to use up the five that come with this thing if you buy it. You're going to use them up very quickly. And not mentioned on the box but there is also included with this kit a package of five humidity indicator strips, just little chemically treated pieces of cardboard. So that's also something that's probably worthwhile investing in a, a box of those if you're going to go this route. The bags are just big enough to fit a one kilogram reel of filament and in each bag I have the filament, a pack of desiccant, and a humidity indicator strip. And then here's one of those plastic clips that's included in how it sort of slides on over the Ziploc part of the bag and you pinch the clip between thumb and forefinger and kind of move it left to right or up and down the length of the Ziploc uh, just to make sure that the Ziploc is truly pressed as tight as it can be and that there are no leaks in the Ziploc area. The real trick is getting the vacuum pump to work with the little one-way air valve that's on each of the bags. The valve doesn't even look like a valve, but it's actually a couple, maybe three layers of plastic that have um, one of those layers uh, perforated. Another layer has these little, um, almost invisible, uh, little valves that are just made out of a, a cutout flap. They're basically valves like you'd find in a little fish tank compressor, except they're made out of plastic. And they're set up to let air escape through this blue hole and not get back in. And the uh, air pump has sort of a rubberized tip on it that's exactly the same size as this blue circle so you kind of dock with that visually and uh, then the rest is all pumping action. What I found using this is um, when the bag has not been used before its reed valves seem to be extra stiff and they might even need to be kind of broken free from not being completely perforated through in the factory, I'm not sure. But the air pump, you don't operate it like you're pumping a tire where your force is pushing it down and then it's easy to lift. You do just the opposite here. It pushes down easily and then you have to use a lot of force to pull it up 
very firmly because that's what's making the suction in the bag and drawing the air through that reed valve. Uh, and I found that it took a good probably 30 firm pulls on the pump while not letting the uh, air seal with the bag break. And I found that I had to do that on a firm surface, otherwise uh, it would leak. But I was able to get a vacuum and really pull the bag in under vacuum for each of the three reels I wanted to store, and that's what they look like. I have ordered an electric pump just to make it a little less uh, arduous to do the vacuum process. So another small refinement to my setup is I wanted better illumination than I had initially on the um, half-high file cabinet I'm using as a bench support for the printer. And to that end, I was looking for some sort of LED lamp with a gooseneck and uh, AC powered. I didn't want to be messing around with USB on this. And I found these two lamps uh, on Amazon for a very reasonable price. They have magnetic bases, uh, they're universal voltage. So I bought the two of them. The base has the power switch on one side and a large diameter neodymium magnet on the other side. If the support surface is not something that a magnet will stick to, such as a wooden bench, uh, the kit does come with these thin metal discs, which are just steel discs, and then some uh, double-sided adhesive foam of the same diameter. And you just peel the covers off the foam and use that to stick the disc to whatever surface, and then the magnet on the base of the lamp sticks to the metal plate. The gooseneck has a pretty good flexibility, but yet stiff enough to hold the lamp steadily. And it's uh, coated in sort of a silicone rubber um, uh, sheath. Um, seems pretty good quality. And the LED lamp is fairly large and very well diffused, so no hot spots. So here I'm testing one of the lamps out. It's just stuck to the side of an appliance, and there it's turned on and uh, then turned away from me and illuminating the nearby surface. So here are some shots of the two lamps just clamped onto the front of the file cabinet, shining at my uh, printer from the left and from the right. And of course I can reposition them as required to illuminate specific areas during print jobs or machine maintenance. Okay, now for the main subject of this video, the printing of another 3D printed serpent. This time I'm going to use the same exact uh, design files that were used for my video on making a 3D printed serpent that I've had out for several months now. Uh, but this time I'm using my own printer to print them instead of somebody else's. And I'm also printing it, as I hinted at, at quarter scale. Uh, the serpent I did before was full-sized, a base serpent. And uh, while not historical, people have made tenor serpents that are one-half the size of a normal base serpent. And just for fun, some people have made soprano serpents, or alto serpents probably more accurately, that are one-quarter the size of a full-size serpent. And I don't have one of those in my collection, so I thought it'd be fun to build one, even though... Those soprano slash alto ones are all but unplayable. They're just too small to be practical. But still, I like the look of them, so that's what this video will now be about. I start out by dragging the first of the many files onto the workspace in my Prusa Slicer program. That's the free software I downloaded from their website. And it's a simple drag and drop, very basic interface, so I just drag the part and it, it materializes in 3D, like in this view. The files already include all the important settings. And the main thing I'm doing here is changing the scale factor from 100 to 25. In other words, from full size to quarter sized. Before that, the part appears real sized according to the workspace. And then after being scaled down, it scales down visually as well. Then all I have to do is click the slice button on the screen and the part changes colors and the uh, 
slice parameters appear in this little dialog box. One important thing in this dialog box is the estimated printing time, which is 33 minutes. In all the printing I did in this project, I found the estimated time to be within one minute of the actual printing time. And for people who aren't accustomed to this, um, the slicing is the act of converting the 3D design file into a format that the printer can use and incorporate all of your settings. And it's basically how the software figures out how to print one layer at a time and build the, the part in subsequent layers. Then all I have to do is export the G code and I just save it to my hard drive in case I want to use them again. And I also copy it to an SD card so I can easily transfer it to the printer. I plug the SD card into the control panel of the printer. It immediately recognizes the file. I select it and it begins heating up the bed and the hot end extruder. The printer goes through its normal pre-print exercise of making sure the bed is level and then it uh, blows a little uh, melted filament out onto the front of the table uh, just to purge the hot end extruder. In this case I'm using black filament because all the parts I'm going to print for a while now are going to be black in color. The printer gets busy printing the part. First it prints a skirt around the part which is just a ring of melted filament. Then it starts building the part proper with the first layer. A few minutes in it already has a nice cylinder built up and after a while it starts making the curved shape where it kind of angles off to the left. Here are a few more images of the progress building up and getting a little wider in the cylinder diameter leaning off a bit more to one side per the curvature of the serpent and now it's becoming very obvious. It's nearly done, it's right up to the top edge and here it's just putting on the finishing touches at the very top edge. The printer moves the extruder head out of the way and I can inspect the first printed part still attached to the printing table which is just the steel sheet. It's still surrounded by the skirt which will be thrown away. Then I just apply a small amount of force and the part breaks free of the print table. And there it is, just a small object. There are the alignment holes on a full size 3D printed serpent. Those would be useful. Here they're not. I label it so I don't lose track of what the part is. And there it's ready and I can move on to the next piece or pieces. I decided to get a little bolder and I put the next four pieces on all to be printed at the same time. I give it an appropriate file name when I save the G code. It appears in the printer off the SD card. I select it. It heats up the bed and the hot end. And it's predicting one hour and 36 minutes to print all those parts. Once again the printer starts out by purging the hot end extruder. Then it prints the skirt. And then it starts printing the first layer of each of the four parts with their first layer circles and then it's just a long process of building it up layer by layer. It does one layer on one part, moves to the next part, does the same layer. When all four parts have that layer then the uh, hot end extruder rises up one notch and starts printing the next layer on all four parts and so on. Now these are all parts that curve on the serpent as most parts do so they all start curving off to the left slowly built up. A lot of these pictures are a little fuzzy because the printer's constantly in motion and I'll try to focus it. The camera will seem to focus but just in the time between I push the trigger and when the image is actually processed um, the printer's moved a little bit so it's very difficult to get a, a frozen image. And there they're all done. With the printer stopped here are some better images all the parts are labeled. These are parts two through five. Since printing four parts went well, now I'm doing the next eight parts. 
and they've been sliced and I'm specifying the G code a file called P06 through P13 I tell it to get the file off the SD card, it gets the G code, I select it in the menu and it immediately starts heating up the bed and the hot end and is predicting one hour and 44 minutes now why was the other one an hour and 30 some odd for four parts and it's only an hour and 40 some minutes for eight parts well the parts are getting progressively smaller so it takes a lot less time to print them so eight smaller parts can be done at about the same time as four larger parts okay it's the same drill it purges the hot end extruder starts printing the skirt that encompasses all the parts it's done the first layer filament here there's a gap in the one part I'm not sure why that is but it worked out okay now these parts curve every which way because by this time on the serpent it's starting to curve back so uh, not all the parts have the same base curvature and some parts are essentially straight although all the parts are essentially conical in nature they're not the same diameter at one end from the other and so here we're done and I've taken the parts off they're all labeled they're pretty small and they all fit in the palm of my hand quite nicely now I'm going to do the remaining ten parts of the main body of the instrument I've got the file loaded in from the SD card it's printed the skirt, it's printed the first layer already and it's building them up quite nicely but as before the parts are even smaller the last one has got a terraced uh, shape to it and that's because there's a decorative ring that's supposed to look like metal so it's a uh, smaller diameter so that ring can fit over it and here the parts are all done being printed they're removed from the sheet and labeled and there they are they took up even less room than the eight parts in the last step okay all 23 parts in black are all sitting on a CD jewel case here just to illustrate how small they are now I'm going to be printing the vocal pieces these are going to be printed in a different color and I'm going to drag all of the vocal pieces onto the work table so I just select the files and uh, drag them onto the workspace they appear full-sized and I just go in here and change a hundred uh, scale factor to 25 percent and click there it copies it to all the other dimensions part is scaled down on the screen I drag it into position now the vocal has five parts but there's also uh, an alternate end piece which I'm gonna select here it's if you want to fit a tenor size mouthpiece or a 50% mouthpiece there's a version with a flared end to accept that and I have to convert it uh, to 25% just like the other ones and there it scaled down I just drag it into a good position and um, there they all are I'm just making some fine adjustments to their positions it's not really critical and uh, then I go and slice them there's the uh, slice now button it only takes a few seconds they change color to show the slicing has been done and the slicing uh, parameter and data pop-up appears shows it should take 49 minutes to print all those parts so I've printed all the black parts now now I have to change uh, filament to the gold colored filament for the parts that would be metal on a normal serpent I've told the printer controller that I want to unload the old black filament and to do that it first has to preheat the hot end which is the hot extruder nozzle and then it'll run the motor here to push the filament back out press the knob to unload the filament and it 
pushes it out, and then I just grab it and pull it out. I remove the black filament reel from the holder and put on the gold filament reel. Okay, I have my light gold PLA filament. I have to take the filament out of its um, retainer here. This kinked up end needs to be cut off. And for that I'm just using my electronics diagonal cutter. Cut it to a point. <clears throat> now I have to select auto load filament. Just insert, just press the knob and insert the filament. It pulled a little bit of filament in, but not enough for it to come out the extruder. It's asking me if I can see the correct color, and the answer is no. So it's purging the, uh, let's see if I can get something white back there. So it's starting to turn gold. I have to tell it. Okay, now it's starting to kick out some gold. I think I'll... Yep. There's the old black and the new gold. Okay. Do a little bit of video of the vocal printing instead of slides. And now it should be printing a purge bead, which it's doing. And then it should be printing the outline of the area that's going to have printed objects on it. And then get busy printing the first layer. These vocal parts are getting pretty tiny. Right in the middle of this print I got the sewing machine LED lamps that I'd ordered and thought weren't coming for a few more days, but they showed up. Now these are just, uh, I'll try to show the Amazon link. They're fairly inexpensive, AC line powered, on off switch on the base. The base has a neodymium magnet on it which can clamp onto metallic surfaces. And uh, there's also a little package of two uh, steel discs and two 3M double-sided foam tape pads so you can affix those metal discs onto non-metallic surfaces and then the neodymium magnets on the lamps will clamp onto those, onto those plates. And my air compressor downstairs is kicked on. So what we have here is um, the five pieces of the vocal, and that's the five pieces except the one on the corner closest to us, and that one is supposed to be the special part that um, has a flare for a different kind of mouthpiece which I'll hopefully get into later. Right now it looks suspiciously unlike the part I thought it was going to be, but it might be because it's still got a ways to go, another 16 minutes of 
printing. 16 minutes remaining is what, oh, now to, down to 15. Because it's just printing these small cylinders, it doesn't spend very long on each one before changing to another one. Us is starting to flare out, or at least it gives the impression that it is, and that's good because that's what it needs to do. So here are all those parts printed now and removed from the printing sheet and labeled and just in my hand for scale. Here are those vocal parts along with all the parts for the main body of the instrument. I have two full-size serpent mouthpieces posed in the background. Okay, I've dragged all the parts for the mouthpieces onto the uh, slicer and you can see the, here there are six parts shown. Uh, each mouthpiece is in two parts and I'm printing the two different design mouthpieces at 25 percent scale but because I'm also planning on using a tenor size mouthpiece I'm printing that mouthpiece here at 50 percent scale that's why there's two more parts and uh, I also not shown uh, as far as the slicer I'd forgotten to slice the so-called metallic ring that goes over the very small end of the serpent body. So um, as the screen here on the Prusa printer shows, I have both the files for the vocal parts and the metallic band. Since I still had gold filament in the printer, I just went ahead and printed the metallic band first. There it is with its skirt around it. And uh, there it is removed from the sheet. And for scale in the palm of my hand. Now for the mouthpieces I'm switching to the ivory colored filament, ivory white as it says here on the reel, and there I've purged out the remaining gold filament in the extruder and you can see the ivory has come out of the extruder now. Okay it's time to make the donuts. I've selected the mouthpieces to print. The printer gets busy with the uh, skirt and the first layer of the mouthpieces. And uh, there was the part I missed earlier. That's where it uh, purged in the nozzle initially. And uh, we're building it up. And it's done. Okay, all the parts I need to print this serpent are all laying out here on the desk now. But in order to use that uh, tenor size mouthpiece, I need to print the vocal parts again in a color that I can quickly tell the difference. And so I've subtracted one part and just have the tapered or the flaring vocal end, and I generate a new G code for that and um, now I'm going to print it. All right, printing the skirt and the first layers. I'm using the silver uh, filament for this. It's supposed to look like I'm using silver plated metal or just silver for this, but it's not quite that shade of silver. And the parts are being built up. And here you can see that it's done. 
and I've got the flared bocal end piece. They're separated from the printing bed and labeled, and now I've added those to my collection of pieces. So I went and took one of the straight pieces of the uh, serpent and printed six of them in the same silver filament, and this was for a gluing test. When I did the full-size 3D printed serpent, I used chemical solvent welding to join the pieces, but with these little tiny pieces on this quarter-sized one, I thought that would be very difficult to hold them and I wouldn't be able to tape them in position very well. I needed some sort of adhesive that would be adequately strong but much quicker to apply. So I decided to experiment with the solvent uh, that I used the first time around as well as a thin super glue or CA glue and also a gel formulation of uh, CA glue. And so here are all those parts. So I've marked each pair of parts with CA, CA gel, and uh, chemical solvent, and I slightly sand the ends of all the parts. Now, these parts are some of the thickest walled ones, and there, there's actually enough width there to use the alignment pins. So I went ahead and drilled those out with my smallest drill bit, and I found that a number 22 AWG bus bar wire, which I have in my electronics lab, was just ideal to fit into those holes to use as alignment pin. Here are the details of the adhesives. Uh, here's the weld on number 16 and uh, it's uh, details from the label. The CA glue I'm going to use is just regular crazy glue and for the gel formulation I'm using this Loctite product and both cases I'm using the little disposable one-use tubes. When using the CA glues I'm going to be using an accelerator or accelerant. In this case I just happen to have this one brand uh, but it basically makes the CA glue set up in just a few seconds almost instantly. Here's how the alignment pins fit in between two parts and here they've all been glued using their respective adhesives and I've done some testing now with the cured adhesive trying to break them apart and they all seem to be about equally strong. I couldn't break any of them using the, the most uh, force I could apply with my hands so I decided to go ahead and use the uh, CA gel glue. Before assembling I sand the end, both ends of each part using a, a fine emery cloth type of sandpaper just enough to assure smooth flat surfaces. Okay, assembling the parts. I'm already into it about four or five parts and now I've added some more parts. Uh, I am starting to use alignment pins now as I get to these thicker walled parts and then continuing on from there. And here's where I'm gluing on the so-called metallic band over the last piece and now that piece has been glued on and the body of the serpent is complete. There's the body of the instrument posed with a bocal stuck in it and uh, that's the front side of it and there's the back side just resting on my hand. It's not a lot bigger than my hand. Here are some other views. Here's with the tenor size mouthpiece and uh, there's with the proper size mouthpiece and the matching bocal uh, viewed from the other side and here's uh, yet another view of the same thing and uh, another few. Now I don't want to disappoint you but um, this is really just a thing to look at. The instrument is impossibly small and not practical to play as an instrument. I was able to barely get a tone out of it using the tenor size mouthpiece but the mouthpiece is so large compared to the acoustical instrument it doesn't match up well and you can't really get a resonant tone out of the instrument. The, the range of pitches I can buzz at on the large mouthpiece just sort of overwhelm the uh, acoustics of the instrument and it doesn't really sound like more than blowing on a blade of grass or blowing on a kazoo or something. Uh, so really not a practical musical instrument at this scale but it's just something I wanted to have around for display. 
Now, you may ask, what are those white lines, those ugly white lines? Well, when CA glue cures, it emits sort of an acidic vapor. And when I immediately spray on the accelerant, which is largely water, I think that's my theory anyway, that it the the uh, accelerant liquid captures the outgassing acidic vapor and it mixes with the water and then it runs around the joint before it evaporates and then that acidity um, causes the color uh, to to change or maybe the white part is just the color of the CA glue when it's been cured through acceleration. Either way it's uh, ugly and I'm trying to decide if I want to just leave it like this so it's clear that it's a 3D printed instrument or whether I'm going to maybe spray paint the body the instrument um, for a better appearance. I haven't decided yet. As an added bonus to tack on to the end of this video, another thing I acquired to make the 3D printing process just a little better is um, now that I'm confident the printer will do everything it's supposed to without me looking over it every second, uh, and some of the times can be pretty long, I wanted to get a dedicated uh, count up, count down, timer, stopwatch device, and this is what I found. This is uh, bought from Amazon. It's pretty inexpensive. It's made by a company calling themselves Dretec, D-R-E-T-E-C, and it's just an up-down counter um, product. Uh, the big button on the top is the start-stop button, so it's easy to hit. And then the other three buttons are for s making uh, selections of mode and so on. And then there's the LCD timing display at the bottom. And certain modes have a, an alarm function, so there's a pretty loud beeper inside and then this uh, red LED on the front. This timer runs off of two AAA cells. In addition to the buttons on the top or front of the unit. On the right side are two slide switches. One of them is to lock it so while you can hit the the main button on the front you can't change any of the other settings. And that might be useful if you're going to be repeating the same time count over and over and over again and you didn't want it to get accidentally uh, changed. Uh, so you can lock it that way. And then there's also a three position slide switch for soft, medium, and loud and that's for the alarm uh, beeper. On the left side is a large button which allows selecting any of the uh, four modes that this counter can be in. Uh, one of them is pure timer mode where it just acts as a clock calendar and another mode is count down uh, which, which has an alarm at the end of it so you can say set it up for an hour 30 minutes and it'll start counting down when it reaches zero, then it'll flash the LED and make the uh, audible alarm sound until you silence it. The next button is count up, and that's like a stopwatch. So you start out with zero, and then you push the big button on the top, it starts counting. It includes uh, hundreds of a second, and uh, then you can pause it by pushing the uh, large button, and then resume it. So you could use this in any sort of way that you would normally use a stopwatch. And then the fourth mode is uh, also a countdown uh, timer, but it's based on the date, not the time of day. So you can, for example, if you want to remember to do something on a particular date in the future, you can program in the new date, and it'll keep track of that based on its internal calendar function. And when it gets to that, then... Um, then it'll alarm and flash the LED. I think, although I haven't tried it yet, I think that you can also uh, choose a time of day instead of just the date itself. Uh, but anyway, it does have that fourth function. Here's what the display looks like when the timer is just in normal clock mode, showing 10.01 and 9 seconds AM. Um, not a really great display to use as your primary clock, but at least you can tell what time this thing thinks it is. Here's one more view. This is in uh, count up mode, and I've got it reset to all zeros. That's um, minutes, seconds, and hundredths of a second. 
Uh, you normally don't have hours on a stopwatch function like this. And now if I were to hit the big start stop button, it would start counting up from zero. So while I could use this to time a print job, if I had no idea how long it was going to take, I could just push this in stopwatch mode, and then when it was done, push the button again and stop it, and then record off the display how long it took to print. But most likely I'm going to use it in the countdown mode, where I program in how long the Prusa printer says it's going to take to print the job, and since I found that to be quite accurate, then I would just uh, mash the big button on the top when the printing starts, and it'll go off beep, 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 beep. Uh, if I'm in another room or doing something else, I'll know that the printing job is done.